Well, on Thursday, European leaders cut a deal to bail out debt-riddled Greece. But how solvent is Europe? My next guest warned that the U.S. is headed down the same road. Daniel Hannan is a British member of the European Parliament who two years ago made headlines with these words to former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown. It's not that you're not apologizing. Like everyone else, I've long accepted that you're pathologically incapable of accepting responsibility for these things. It's that you're carrying on willfully worsening our situation, wantonly spending what little we have left. You cannot spend your way out of recession or borrow your way out of debt. And Peter Schiff is an American businessman. He says the government is stifling production, and he shared his opinion with the anti-Wall Street protesters earlier this week. How, How much do you think I should pay? What would be fair for me? I don't know what Just fair it is. I can't tell you that. Well, what do you? I believe in a progressive How about the same as everybody else? How much should I pay? Okay, well, the, exactly. I look, like all right, I'm paying 35%. All right, I, that would be a huge tax cut for me. I pay much more than 35% of my total what income in tax. Pay? What do you think of Less than plan? eight, and I employed her. Well, and... Well, these two gentlemen don't mince words. Daniel Hannan, the author of the book, The New Road to Serfdom, and Peter Schiff, who also has a book called How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes. They both join me now. It's good to have you, Daniel, and uh, Peter. Welcome back to the show. Daniel, let me start to you because I want to ask you about what's going on in Europe and how much you think that is mirroring what is taking place and is perhaps going to take place in the United States. Uh, tell me about the similarities you see, and do you think our president has a responsibility and a role in what you see happening? Well, let's start with what's happening in Europe. We have a situation where the European leaders are going to borrow this astronomical sum, this almost inconceivable sum of a trillion euros, so $1.4 trillion. Now, from whom are they going to borrow it, first of all? I mean, if somebody had $1.4 trillion lying around, do you think they'd have found some use for it in the last three years? But more to the point, what's the collateral? Who stands guarantor? And the answer is the guarantors ultimately are the taxpayers of Italy, Spain, Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. In other words, the guarantors are the same people as the debtors. Now, in the United States, that's known as a Ponzi scheme, and it carries a prison sentence. There's no, there's no new money here. Is the U.S. going in the same direction? Well, you know, there's still time for you guys to turn off the road. We can see you in our rear view mirror, but you, you're not nearly as far down this road as we are. But the same basic problem, the thing that Peter Schiff's been talking about, that you're uh, consuming more and more with any commensurate increases in production, that's just as true of the U.S. as it is of Europe. Peter, uh, let me get to the question of uh, the current administration. How much responsibility do they bear for these policies and the resulting calamity that uh, Daniel has just described? Oh, quite a bit. And first, let me say, I wish we had Daniel as a member of Congress as opposed to Parliament. We could use him on this side of the Atlantic. But, you know, sure, President Obama, he inherited a bad hand, but, you know, he played it very poorly. And a lot of the people who are in Congress now are the same people who were in Congress uh, during the entire uh, decade. And that's when the problems were created. We blew up the housing bubble over a period of time. We did that with cheap money from the Federal Reserve. We did it with guaranteed mortgages from Freddie and Fannie. And both parties are complicit in that behavior. But unfortunately, instead of changing the failed policies of the Bush administration, all Obama has done is expand them and made them worse. We want to keep both of you guys here because when we come back, we're going to continue the discussion about what's taking place in the United States. And are we headed down this same path as Europe? And what does that mean for that person out there watching at home saying, how does this affect me? You're going to find out more with Daniel and Peter when we return. We're continuing our discussion. I want to go right back to Daniel. Uh, Daniel, you have said between 1980 and 1992 that within the entire European Union, there was virtually not a single new job created outside of the UK. Uh, how on earth did that happen? Virtually no new private sector jobs, there were some government jobs created. The trouble in Europe is that it is very difficult to fire people, and therefore firms are very reluctant to hire people. They don't want to put people on their books in the good times that they might not be able to drop in the bad times. So when there is an upswing in Europe, uh, the take on of new staff is very slush. We have a much higher level of strong unemployment, and that's what we should be tackling. Instead of this, 
crazy idea that you carry on spending more and more, repeating all the mistakes that led to this calamity in the first place. We need to be spending less. We need to be liberalizing, restructuring our labor markets. We need to be more competitive. Western Europe is collapsing the percentage of world GDP. And the extraordinary thing is that the governments of all the EU states are still pursuing the policies that brought us to this pass in the first place. More cheap money, trying to inflate the bubble again, you know, giving the patient more of the medicine that made him sick in the first place. Peter, you've said the same thing essentially about creating jobs in the United States, that it's very difficult to create them because once you create them, you just about aren't able to let them go. React to what Daniel has said in job creation for you in your businesses here in the U.S. How hard is it to create a job? How hard, it is, how hard is it to get rid of a job that needs to uh, uh, maybe be rescinded? Yeah, I've been saying that for years. Maybe if I could say it with an English accent, maybe it would sound better because <laughs> I really like the way it sounded coming from Daniel. But he is absolutely right. I mean, that's where jobs come from. And I'm an employer. I employ a lot of people. I know firsthand how difficult it is to hire people, how expensive the government makes it to hire people. I know a lot of small business owners that do anything they can to avoid hiring people, not because they don't want help, but because they don't want all the liabilities, all the obligations, all the rules and regulations and taxes that go along with hiring people. So if we simply can free up the labor markets, level the playing field, allow businesses to create pro jobs without having to worry that they're going to get sued or fined for doing it, and we're going to get a lot more jobs. Let's talk about regulation as, as we're really structuring this segment. So we're looking at the similarities between what has already been happening in Europe and it's a really collapsed economy and what's almost on the verge of happening here in America. Daniel, how much has regulation in Europe played a part in the financial uh, calamities that you're facing? Well, here's a scary statistic for you, Mike. We had in Western Europe, the share of world GDP in the mid 1970s was 36 percent. That was uh, that was Western Europe's share of the world economy. Today, it's 26 percent. And in 2020, it'll be 15%. Now, that has happened because we've been regulating, we've been taxing, we've been centralizing. And the single biggest reason we've been doing that is that we've been taking power in from the nation states and concentrating them in Brussels, because that takes away the competition. The main constraint on an interventionist government is international competition. You can raise your taxes up to a certain level, and then the money starts going abroad to friendlier tax jurisdictions. You can be very generous with your maternity leave and paternity leave and limited working hours and so on. Up to a certain point, then the jobs start going abroad. The European Union gives you an alternative. Instead of facing competition from your neighbors, you can export your costs to them. And that was fine in the 1950s when the competition was only coming from other European countries. But today, when the competition is coming from China, from India, it is calamitous. And that is the proximate cause for the disaster that we're seeing in Europe's economy today. All right, Peter, let's talk about uh, an area of heavy regulation that's coming to American businesses, Obamacare, as it's being implemented and instituted. What's that going to cost American businesses, and will it have a detrimental effect on hiring and keeping employees? Well, it's going to cost trillions. No one knows exactly how many. But the real problem is government. The reason that health care is so expensive in the first place is the same reason that college tuitions are so expensive. It's because government gets in there and subsidizes it. Before government was involved, health care was far less expensive and more accessible to more people. If we simply brought market forces back into health care, we would have competition if we can separate health insurance from employment, which is a consequence of our tax code. If people were shopping around and not you know, using health insurance as prepaid medical, we would have much lower uh, health care costs. But instead of taking a free market approach, we're just going to get the government even more involved. We're going to run health care costs up even higher and make it more expensive for employers to hire people. So what we end up doing is we destroy jobs in the process and we make health care more expensive. Well, I wonder what Daniel and Peter might say to President Obama to get the economy on the right track again. Well, if you want to know, I'm going to be asking them when we come back. Stay with us. Before break, we were talking about the impact of Obamacare. Daniel, uh, England has long had socialized medicine. How much has the government uh, safety net of socialized medicine contributed uh, to the economic hardships that you face, not only in the UK, but is, that is faced all over uh, the European Union? 
Well, on healthcare, the trouble is that it's not a safety net. If it was a safety net, if it were just there for people who couldn't afford healthcare, no one would really have a problem with it. The trouble is it's a monopoly. And that, is, that has damaged, uh, it hasn't just damaged our economy, it's damaged our healthcare more immediately. Um, you know, governments don't run things very well. They weren't very good at installing telephones, they weren't very good at building cars, they weren't very good at operating airlines. They're not very good at running a healthcare system. On most of the international comparators, survival rates, waiting times, and if you've got stroke or heart disease, how long does it take to, to see your doctor? Are you likely to be alive after one year, two years, five years? Britain is not the worst in the world, but it's pretty far down the league tables because the state is a bad manager. You know, what advice would I give Obama? First of all, this is not the kind of expense you need to be embarking on at the current economic juncture. You've got a lot to worry about before this massive expansion of state power and the economy. But secondly, you've got to start living within your means. You know, the president was saying, we, we, we stand ready to help Greece and all the rest of it. You know, you don't help an indebted friend by pushing more loans on him. If you really wanted to help, get on top of the debt crisis here. The world depends much more than people like to admit on the success and prosperity of the US economy. The world doesn't owe us a living in the West. You know, the, the guys working long hours in China and India are not doing so just so that we can buy the plastic goods at the other end as some kind of entitlement. We have to pay our way in the world. And until that happens, power is going to carry on shifting to some pretty authoritarian and unpleasant places. All right, Peter, I want to ask you, having been down at the site of the demonstrations for Occupy Wall Street, you had some interesting exchanges. What kind of reaction did you get as a business person trying to explain how capitalism works? Well, you know, there's a lot of hostility there. There's a lot of resentment, and people really don't understand how capitalism works. You know, there was one person there that thought that I had a duty to share my wealth. Uh, but what she doesn't understand is the way you accumulate wealth is by sharing it. You know, I use the example of Steve Jobs. He accumulated billions for himself, but in the process, he shared his wealth with the entire world. How many people benefit uh, from Apple products? How many people got jobs at Apple? How many investors profited by buying Apple stock? Steve Jobs couldn't have become so wealthy if he didn't share it, but he didn't share it through taxation. He shared it through capitalism, and that's what people have to understand. They don't understand how capitalism works. They want a better life. They want jobs. They want prosperity, yet they're looking to government to provide those things. That's not where they're going to get it. They're going to get it from capitalism, and not by enslaving the capitalists, the entrepreneur with high taxes, but by liberating him from taxes, from government, so he can go out there and create the prosperity that everybody shares. I, I mean, I think we all know that some of the people down there probably have no idea why they're there, other than there's free food is something to do. But there are some people who do raise some legitimate questions about big banks, big insurance companies, Wall yeah. Street brokerage firms got bailed out by the government, and they wonder why students and others aren't getting a bailout if it's going to be such a wonderful thing to bail out people from the government. So, Peter, how do you respond to those who do have some legitimate uh, hostilities toward the bailout mentality? Oh, yeah. Well, but two wrongs don't make a right. That was one of the reasons I was against the bailouts. I was afraid of the bad precedent we were establishing, the moral hazard. And so instead of asking for more bailouts, let's condemn the bailouts that have already taken place. And rather than blaming Wash I mean, Wall Street for accepting the bailout, I mean, anybody is going to accept money if the government offers it. Why don't we just condemn the government for making the bailouts available in the first place? You know, what the protesters are protesting is not capitalism. They're actually in favor of it without knowing it. They're protesting the absence of capitalism or crony capitalism. Under capitalism, there would have been no bailouts for anybody. Daniel, very quickly, I just want to ask you, as you look at the U.S., do you have uh, words of hope and optimism, or do you see us uh, driving off the cliff? First of all, I just want to agree very much with what Peter said. You know, whatever has happened since 2008, it is not capitalism. In a capitalist system, bad banks would have failed. Their profitable operations would have been bought by their better competitors. You know, these guys should be occupying the Fed or occupying Congress. They've picked the wrong target. What would I say to the U.S.? I would say stick to the vision of your founders. You've got this extraordinarily good fortune that you have a, a system where you can hold your rulers to account. And you started using that system, as I understand it, last year at the midterm elections. You started selecting candidates who are more in tune with public opinion and who understand that you can't carry on borrowing more, spending more, taxing more 
in perpetuity. You are the heirs of a sublime patrimony. Stick fast to it. Pass it on intact to your children. That's wonderful. And Daniel, I got to tell you, it does this old American heart good to hear a Brit tell me that I need to go back to the founders of this great country, and I do appreciate it. Daniel Hannon and Peter Schiff, two great, great guys with a lot of thought we need to pay attention to. Thank you both for joining us.